Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12. You know the deal. This is going to be chapter 6 of the book, Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J.H. Allen. The title of chapter 6 is The Broken Brotherhood. The Broken Brotherhood. So let's get going. All right, let's get reading here. In the last chapter, we gave much testimony from the scriptures showing that the ten tribed kingdom is dealt with both in history and prophecy, much of which is yet unfulfilled, as the house of Israel and other titles, some of which you will find quite prominent in this chapter, while the three-tribed kingdom, which is composed of some of the Jewish people, is dealt with as the house of Judah and the Jews. Take a look at uh, the second chapter of Revelation and verse 9. Take a look at that. And uh, even better, take a look at the third chapter of Revelation and verse 9 about um, a certain re uh, Christ-rejecting group who will worship at the feet of those that love Christ. Well, you won't hear that in 98% of the, probably the churches, maybe 99%, I don't know. If any of our readers are not yet satisfied on this point, we promise that they shall still have an abundant opportunity to become thoroughly convinced. Professor C.A.L. Totten of Yale University, Bob's note here, Yale and Harvard were started as Bible colleges, as was Cambridge and Oxford, believe it or not. They were all Bible colleges. And I've actually heard of this Totten guy. <clears throat> so I don't remember where, but I remember his name. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The president of Harvard now um, has a, well, let's just say he has a rabbi. So... Uh, yeah whatever happened to uh bible college i don't know professor c.a.l totten of yale university says i can never be too thankful to the almighty that in my youth he used the late professor wilson to show me the difference between the two houses the very understanding of this difference is the key by which almost the entire Bible becomes intelligible. And I cannot state too strongly that the man who has not yet seen that Israel of the Scripture is totally distinct from the Jewish people is yet in the very infancy the mere alphabet of biblical study and that to this day the meaning of seven-eighths of the Bible is shut to his understanding." Unquote. This will become more and more apparent as we proceed with a few brief outlines of the histories of these two kingdoms. Israel displeased the Lord by her idolatry, but it is quite evident for some time after the division, Judah pleased him by her faithfulness, and it is also evident that for a short period, fraternal relations existed between the two kingdoms. These evidences are found in the history of the war which occurred between Israel and Moab in the days of Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, and of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Bob's note here. Jehoshaphat was a good king. He, he was a great king. I mean, he loved the Lord, absolutely. He had his faults, 
Boy, I tell you what, if I uh, numbered all my faults, uh, I'd have to have a calculator that uh, probably goes up to eight or nine or 10 or 11 digits, maybe 12, I don't know. But um, so, yeah. Uh, during the reign of Ahab, he had conquered Moab and the king of Moab paid him a revenue of 100,000 lambs and 100,000 uh, rams with the wool. So 100,000 lambs, L-A-M-B-S, and 100,000 rams, R-A-M-S, with the wool. But upon the ascension of Ahab's son to the throne of Israel, the king of Moab rebelled against him. And so it is recorded that King Jeho Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and numbered all Israel. 2 Kings 3, 6. Uh, numbering. Bob's note here. What does it mean to be numbering? Well, you know, counting. Uh, how many soldiers do I have for an army here? You know, it's, it's a census. That's basically what it is. Here the expression... All Israel has reference to all the region of country which was occupied by the ten tribes of which the kingdom of Israel was composed. Samaria was their capital city and the dwelling place of the king. But when the king of Moab rebelled against him, it was but natural and also good generalship that he should want to know the fighting strength of the kingdom. So he made a tour throughout the realm that he might know just how many fighting men he had. But it seems that he returned fully satisfied that he did not have an army of sufficient strength to ensure victory. So, for he sent a message to the king of Judah saying, and I quote, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? To this, the king of Judah replied in the affirmative. Yes, right, saying, I will go up, for I am as thou art, and my people as thy people. As a matter of course, he could say, my people are as thy people. For the people were brethren and subjects of brother nations, all being seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the children of the promise. These two kings further decided upon, uh, while holding a council of war, to go up by the way of the wilderness of Edom and to ask the king of Edom to join them against the Moabites. For the Edomites were also kinfolk of these two nations, they being the descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob, whose name was changed to Edom after he sold his birthright. The king of Edom consented to go with them, and thus the children of the flesh and the children of the promise made common cause and went up together against the king of Moab. But when they made a seven days journey, they got into trouble, for there was no water, for that great army of men and the beasts of burden, which were compelled to have with them. Uh, Bob's note here. I mean, not only do you have to supply food, but you got to supply water. Uh, to all your men and let's face it you don't want your your guys carrying uh, 70 80 pounds you know uh, 30 to 35 kilograms of equipment I mean you know not only do you have to carry your weapons and your spears um, but I mean what are, you know are you gonna sleep out in the out in the Sun or out, you know, you're, you you want to have a tent, and you got to carry food, and you got to carry water, uh, water weighs um, seven pounds a gallon. How many gallons of water can you carry for seven days? I mean, you know, so you're going to have to have uh, animals like camels carrying you know, carrying uh, your stuff, your water, and your food, your tents, you know, and they need water too. So, you know, it's beasts of burden. 
At the beginning of the chapter, which contains the history of this war concerning the king of Israel, we have the following. Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And he reigned 12 years and wrought evil in the sight of the Lord. So this, this king of Israel, uh, Bob's note here, he's, uh, he's not a good egg. No. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. But not like his father and his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefore, therefrom. So he was not a huge sinner. He was just a moderate sinner. But still, the Lord doesn't like sins. And Bob's note here, there are sins and then there are abominations. So, yeah. And God really, really, really hates abominations. Uh, there's a few things called abominations in the Bible. Uh using uh, men for sexual pleasure by other men is one of those abominations. I hate to even say the word that starts with an S. Uh, the YouTube people, you know, yeah. And um, witchcraft is another one of those, you know, Satanism. And... Um, yeah, there's a few others, things that God calls abominations. And they will get you in trouble really, really fast. All right, page 82. But as soon as they were in trouble, and the idolatrous king of Israel found there was no water, then in startled fear he cried out, saying, The Lord hath brought us... Uh, the Lord hath brought us three kings out here to destroy us. How quickly, when tortured with guilty fear, the idolater knew there was a Lord who had power to destroy them, or at least to destroy him, for he knew that he deserved it, and only said, us three, because of a spirit of guilty cowardice which hoped to shift the responsibility, or if failing, in that to insist that others were fully as much to blame as he, which is so often seen in frightened but impenitent men. Impenitent. Um, people that uh, find no repentance. Uh, but it was not so with Jehoshaphat, the God-fearing king of Judah, for, it, for he at once asked, is there not here a prophet of the Lord that way that we may inquire of the Lord by him? Oh yeah, Jehoshaphat. Oh, well, Bob's note here. Jehoshaphat was a a good king, and and he's like, hey, let's let's take it to the Lord here. No doubt, the thought of Jehoshaphat in asking this question was that by making. Uh, inquiry of the Lord, they would receive such divine instruction as would enable them to escape the threat and danger. For when one of the servants of the king of Israel, upon hearing this inquiry, stepped forward and informed them that Elisha, E-L-I-S-H-A, Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha, the prophet was with the company, the king of Judah rejoiced and said, the word of the Lord is with him. Um, and by the way, Elisha, E-L-I-S-H-A, was the successor to Elijah, E-L-I-J-A-H, when uh, he was taken up into a whirlwind, uh, chariots of and horses of fire, 
I did an hour and 40 study on the life of Elijah. And he's coming back, people. He's coming back. Oh, yeah, he's going to come back. All these uh, idiots that believe in uh, preterism, that everything was fulfilled in 70 AD, they're going to be shocked when Elijah returns. Oh, yeah. I honestly think that uh, preterists, or people that think all Bible prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD, that uh, when the man of sin comes, the, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the beast, uh, those are different names that Paul and John and um, give the, uh, you know, the Antichrist, the Antichrist. There's, going to, there's many Antichrists, but there's going to be one. Um, I honestly think preterists are going to think that the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, the Antichrist, whatever name you want to call him, um, that they're going to accept him as the Messiah. That's what I think. Um, my Bible tells me the man of sin comes first before Christ does. But, hey, if you believe this happened in 70 AD, then guess what? The Antichrist has already came. So now they're waiting for Jesus. Or, well, they're not waiting for Jesus. They're waiting for the, Mos the Moshiach. Yeah. Nope, I'm not waiting for the Messiah. I'm waiting for the man of sin. And all your pre-tribbers, they're also... Uh, looking for, well, I had a pastor so-called to say, uh, we're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ. Well, then I guess the Antichrist is your Christ, the man of sin. But uh, time will tell. And you know what the difference between me and them is? I don't pass a collection plate. I don't beg for money. And those of you that have helped me, thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Um, there was a few months there I had a rough time, but uh, I'm doing okay now. And some of you really helped me out. And may the Lord bless you for it. But, um, you know, you don't have me... Uh, uh, if you send me a donation now, uh, I will send you a prayer shawl that's been blessed by the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, dipped in the River Jordan, the very place where Jesus' feet crossed over. Uh, praise a Jesus. Uh, yeah. And it's only nineteen ninety-five. And if you order now, you get a free pen and pencil set. You know, whatever. Uh, yeah. Oh, shut up, Bob. Get back to reading the book. So, so King Jehoshaphat um, rejoiced and said, The word of the Lord is with him. When Elisha was found and these three kings were ushered into his presence, he addressed himself to the king of Israel, saying, <laughs> So here it is, the prophet is in the presence of the king of Israel, the wicked king of Israel, what does he say? What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. <laughs> go go talk to say base the Bob translation would be, hey, what do you, you wait a minute, I'm a prophet I'm a prophet of Abraham, Isaac, and uh, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why don't you go to your prophets? You know, the devils? Yeah, those are, go to the, go to the devils. And, uh, yeah, go to those prophets. What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. But to this the king steer fe still fearful vouchsafed only the reply, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Then Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, surely 
were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. See, uh, Bob's note here. If you've ever read the book of Genesis, when God was getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot was there, and Abraham bargained with the Lord, and said, Lord, you're going to destroy the city, you know, will you destroy it for 50 righteous? And I'm, you know, paraphrasing. The Lord said, I wouldn't destroy it for 50 righteous. Well, how about 40? No, not 40. How about 30? No, not for 30. If there's 30 left, I'll spare the city. How about 20? I'll spare the city for 20 righteous. Lord, let me speak one last time. Be Please be not angry with me. How about 10? And the Lord said, I won't destroy it for 10 righteous. Well, guess what? There was not 10 righteous in the entire city. Just Lot's family. That was it. So guess what? Sodom and Gomorrah burned. Yeah. Burned up. So God, God's prophet, Elisha, saw the wicked king of Edom. I remember Edom married into the Canaanite line. And he's looking at the evil, wicked king of Israel. And the only reason the prophet's even talking at all is because good King Jehoshaphat of Judah. Matter of fact, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention something. Uh, if it if the book doesn't cover something, I want to cover something. So, so. As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. There are reasons given, and there are, and they are weighty ones, why the prophet of God should regard the king of Judah and emphasize the fact of his presence in contrast to the king of Israel, for through the prophet Hosea the Lord declares, Ephraim, uh, here's the book of Hosea. Ephraim compass, compasseth me with about with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. Yet Judah, but Judah yet re ruleth with God and is faithful with the saints. Ah, yes, Judah is not only faithful among the saints, but she yet has power and ruling influence with God. Here are reasons abundant for that honorable distinction which was conferred upon Judah and her God-honoring king. It was because of them that the Lord sent water to that famishing army and gave them victory over the Moabites. And I believe the Moabites were, uh, they were, um, uh, Bob's note here, they were, uh, the Moabites were Lot's daughters, uh, children, who had intermarried, I believe I could, I believe they intermarried with the Canaanites. God was not happy with the Moabites. They were enemies of Israel. All right, so let's keep reading. But Israel and her king, although serving Jeroboam's calves, yet in a time of trouble, when moved by guilty fear, admitted the power of of the God of their fathers, hence lies and deceit were in Ephraim Israel, but faithfulness as yet among the uh, children of Judah. But there came a time when Judah was not among the faithful, and when she lost her power with God, and there also came a time when the fraternal relations were broken between these brother nations. There are many instances of the severance of brother brotherly harmony between these nations. But the following instance, which occurred in the days of Amaziah, king of Judah, and Joash, king of Israel, not only reveals the broken ties, 
but justifies the term Ephraim Israel. Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and made them captains over thousands and over hundreds according to the houses of their fathers through all Judah and Benjamin. Uh, the Levites were priests, not warriors. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them 300,000 choice men able to go forth to war that could handle spear and shield. He hired an 100,000 mighty men of valor, valor out of Israel for a hundred talents of silver. But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel, to wit, all the children of Ephraim. But if thou go and do it to be strong for the battle, God shall make thee fall before the enemy, for God hath power to help and to cast down. And Amaziah said unto the man of God, But what shall we do with the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? And the man of God answered, The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Then Amaziah separated them to wit the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again. Wherefore, their anger was greatly kindled against Judah, and they returned home in great anger, and the soldiers of the army, which Amaziah sent back, that they should not go with him to battle, fell upon the cities of Judah from Samaria even to Beth Horon, and smote three thousand of them, and took much spoil. Thus we see that the terms Israel and Ephraim are used interchangeably, for at one time we read, the army out of Israel, and at another, but concerning the same transaction, the army that has come out of Ephraim. Also, the man of God told the king of the Jews that if he went into battle with the hundred thousand men that he had hired out of Israel, the Lord would defeat him, for God was not, for God was not with Israel, to wit Ephraim. And further, when the king of Judah sent the soldiers back home, he sent them from the nation which the sacred history calls the Jews, to that which is called Israel. There is one other point was which must not be overlooked at this juncture. That is, that Ephraim is the representat representative of the house of Joseph, that Joseph represents the birthright blessing, which carries with it the promise of a multitude of children, which was originally given to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and that it sometimes occurs that the name of Joseph the father instead of Ephraim the son is used when recording facts of history or prophecy concerning the ten tribed kingdom. This does not often occur, but the following is an instance. And I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them again to to place them, for I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I have not cast them off. For I am the Lord their God, and will hear them, and Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall rejoice as through wine. Zechariah 10, 6 and 8 through 8. Zechariah, Z-E-C-H-A-R-I-A-H. I always get Zephaniah and Zechariah mixed up. So, this text clearly shows that the names of Ephraim and Joseph are titles of the ten tribes kingdom in uh, contradiction from Judah and the Jews' titles of the three tribes kingdom. And since it is true that Judah and Joseph are the inheritors of the two special promises which pertains to the two covenants, we need not be surprised at this, but should rather expect that these two names would stand thus contrasted. But all the more should we expect this 
when we see the fact so clearly revealed in the history of the posterity of these two men that the birthright name and people are representatives of one nation and that Judah's scepter is swaying over the other. But these facts are still more clearly brought out in one of Ezekiel's prophecies as follow. Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one in my hand. And the sticks wherein thou writest shall be in thy hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. That is in Ezekiel 37, 15 through 23. Bob's note here. I did a commentary on the book of Ezekiel. Not the best in the world, but, you know, hey, I did what I could. Also did a commentary on Isaiah and Jeremiah. You know, the Old Testament is so sadly neglected today. I mean, I hear people say, oh, I'm a New Testament Christian. Uh, so you're going to tell me you're going to read a a novel and you're only going to read the last 25% of the book. You're, you're going to skip the entire three quarters of the book and read the last few chapters and think you understand what's going on. Really? Really? Well, if you say so, but, uh, yeah, but Ezekiel and Isaiah, what an incredible, incredible books. So who are, who is this king that's going to rule the two kingdoms that are going to become one? Well, it's good. This is going to be uh, Christ's kingdom when he returns in glory. I mean, it's pretty plain and simple. So, all right, let's keep reading here. Many things will need to be explained before we can show the relative place in the history of these peoples of all the facts here and mentioned, but this much is clear. One, that there are two sticks, two nations, or kingdoms. Two, that Judah, who inherited the scepter and crown, has one of those sticks, kingdoms, or nations, while Joseph Ephraim has the other. Three, that Judah has with him as companions, some of the children of Israel, and that Ephraim has some of the tribes of Israel, who are his fellows and his companions. 4. That when this prophecy was written, they were divided, and, all, and that all the people belong, belonging to the race had gathered either to Judah or to Joseph, or in other words, either to the scepter or to the birthright. 
5, that at some future time, they are again to be united, become one kingdom, and then remain so forever. 6, that when they are thus united, one king shall be king over them all. And when this takes place, the people will have been so lifted up by divine power and so enriched by grace, grace, that they will no longer defile themselves, commit no transgressions, or in any way displease the Lord, but shall be his accepted people, and he shall be their God. Evidently, one of those sticks is the scepter, and the other is the birthright. For these and the promises connected with each are of general interest to all the children of promise, but they are the exclusive property of the two men, Judah and Joseph, who are the special subjects of the prophecy, while the entire posterity of Jacob is the general subject. But this figure of the two sticks, or staffs, is used in another prophecy, which pertains to the two houses, and which should be of profound interest to all. Beginning in the midst of the 7th verse of the 11th chapter of Zechariah, we have the following. All right, so, Zechariah. I took unto me two staves. Uh, if you don't know what a stave is, it's like a club. I took unto me two staves, the one I called beauty, and the other I called bands. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. And it was broken in that day, and so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it to the potter, a goodly price that I was priced at of them. And I took 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Then I cut asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Israel and Judah. That's in Zechariah 11, 7 through 14. Uh, Bob's note here. Uh, do you recognize this? Of 30 pieces of silver? Casting it in the Lord's house, buying in the potter's field? Uh, what did, what did Judas Iscariot when he betrayed the Lord? What did he, uh, what was he promised to betray the Lord for? Was it not 30 pieces of silver? And then he came back and threw the money down in the uh, temple. And uh, the you-know-whos were like, well, pff, we can't put this money back in the treasury. It's the price of blood. So they bought the potter's field, remember? Uh, maybe I should, maybe I should, uh, yeah, let me take a look at that real quick. All right, Bob's note here. Ch uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. Uh, these were not Catholic priests, unlike the Baptists love to say, oh, these were the Catholics, these were the Romans. Uh, no, Catholic priests did not exist back then. Uh, the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, Judas Iscariot, then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. 
saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You know, what do we care? What do we care? What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priests took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you guys are uh, lying and committing murder, but you're worried about uh, putting blood money back into the treasury. Uh, okay. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in, wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. Okay. So let's keep reading the book. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Then after a certain transaction in which their Lord was sold for 30 pieces of silver, he cut asunder his other staff called bands, i.e. Judah, uh, that he might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. What a great marvel marvelous fulfilled truth is herein declared. We are not yet prepared to explain. At this juncture, we can only call your attention to the fact that Ezekiel's prophecy concerning the putting together of the two sticks could not have been fulfilled until after the transaction which concerns the 30 pieces of silver. And that when it does take place, it must be in harmony not only with those blessed results, which we have already mentioned, but also with that which is contained in the rest of that prophecy a part of which is as follows. And they shall dwell in the land which I have given to Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Bob's note here. People that say that all prophecy of the Bible that was fulfilled in 70 AD, uh, has this happened? No. No, this hasn't happened yet. Nope. I just, you know, it's amazing. They, they, people that call themselves preterists that say everything fulfilled in 70 AD, um, it's amazing. They could take one or two verses and make an entire doctrine out of it. You know, that's sort of like the Pentecostals when they're jibber jabbering with what they call tongues. And they make a, an entire church out of it. But boy, they have to ignore huge swaths of the Bible to make their little thing work. So, yeah, I don't know. What can I tell you? All right, let's keep reading. Um, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. Um, is there a covenant of peace? Are we having peace in this world or are there wars? You know, since the United Nations was created, uh, what, 47, 48, 1947, 48, um, what was the first act of the United Nations? Uh, the creation of the Israeli state, right? And I don't think there's been one day of peace since that day, since the United Nations has been created. And uh, there's just wars, 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 wars. So, you know, what can I tell you? Uh, let's keep reading. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting 
covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of, uh, of them forevermore. The brotherhood is still broken, but it shall be mended. Ah, okay. Um, that is the end of the chapter. Page 89 of the uh, book, Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J.H. Allen. And um, this is a, oh, I should, uh, well, I, I promised I would uh, mention something here. So let me uh, look something up. All right, let's uh, take a look at a little story. I mean, I've done this study before, but um, perhaps you've heard of Ahab and Jezebel. Let's just say the Lord was not very happy with um, King Ahab and Jezebel. I mean, you could do an entire study on just Ahab and Jezebel. You know, there's a reason why the Lord... Um, is well let me rephrase this the enemies of israel and the enemies of the lord want to lead the lord's people into sin you know movies and everything yeah because they know that the lord will not only withdraw their his protection upon his people but that he will punish them and allow them to be destroyed and, you know, that's why they always want to lead us into sin. So let's read about Ahab. 1 Kings 16 and verse 33. And Ahab made a grove. Now, remember, the uh, groves was where they practiced Satanism. They did human sacrifice. Satanism. You know, there was a reason why the Lord said to get rid of Satanists and witches. He didn't say preach to them and tell them about the love of Jesus. No, he said get rid of them. If people knew how many child, child uh, kidnappings there were in this country, you know, but nothing, nothing, nothing shocks church people. They, church people make me sick. They really do. Everything the Lord says to do, they argue against. And everything the Lord says not to do, they argue for. You know, God's going to destroy these people. And they're looking for the pre-trib rapture. Well, they're going to get raptured. But uh, probably not in the way they think. But 1 Kings 16.33, And Ahab, now remember Ahab is king of Israel. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger. Ooh, let's read that again. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Ahab was a bad egg. Lord, the Lord was angry with Ahab. First Kings 16.30 And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Yeah, you get the idea, right? All right, so let's take a look. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 18. Uh, have you ever heard of the expression, jumping Jehoshaphat? I, I don't know where it comes from. I've heard it. But uh, Jehoshaphat was a good king. The Lord, He loved the Lord. The Lord loved him. He wasn't perfect, but he loved him. Ahab was 
hated the Lord and the and the Lord hated him. You know. So let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 18. Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. Now remember, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Ahab is king of Israel. And Jehoshaphat joined with Ahab, the righteous with the wicked. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. So there, there's a war going on here. Okay, there's a war going on. Verse 3, And Ahab, king of Israel, uh, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I mean, right here it tells you, king of Israel, king of Judah. Oh, but, but Chaplain Bob, uh, they're all the same. Yeah, only if you listen to demon nominational churches are they all the same. The Bible tells you they're different. So, and Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? Hey, uh, hey, uh, king Jehoshaphat, uh, will you go with me to fight this war? And he, Jehoshaphat, answered him, and, and, uh, and he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we, we will be with thee in the war. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Let's, let's, let's ask about the word of the Lord. Therefore the king of Israel gathered together of prophets 400 men, you know, false prophets, and said unto them, Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle? Or shall I forbear? In other words, should I go or should I stay? And they said, go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? So Jehoshaphat's spirit is sensing, uh, wait a minute, you got 400 prophets here. But something's not right. Is there somebody else we can talk to here? And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. For he never prophesieth good unto me, but always evil. The same is Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. And the king of Israel called for one of his officers and said, Fetch quickly Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, sat either of them on his throne, clothed in their robes, and they sat in a void place at the entering in of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. You know, the, the, the false prophets, the prophets of the devil. And Zedekiah, the son of Chenanah, Chen, Chen Anna, something like that, had made him horns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, with these thou shalt push Syria until they be consumed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Oh yeah, they're pro false prophets, false, falsely prophesying. And verse 12, And the messenger that went to call Micaiah spake to him, saying, Behold, the words of the prophets declare good to the king with one assent. Let thy word, therefore, I pray thee, be like one of theirs, and speak thou good. So the wicked king's messenger goes to the prophet, the good the true prophet of the Lord and says, Hey, all these guys are saying good things and we want you to give the same kind of report. You know, we want you to say the same thing. Verse 13. And Micaiah said, 
As the Lord liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. And when he was come to the king, the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And he said, Go ye up and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. You know, he's saying the same thing that all the other false prophets are. But I imagine he said it in a mocking tone. You know, because they kind of knew something was up here. Go ye up and prosper, and they shall be delivered unto into the, your hand. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee? You know, adjure means like, swear to God, you know, like when you go up before the court and you say, uh, do you swear on the Bible to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Well, nowadays you'd be swearing to a Babylonian Talmud, but uh, yeah. And the king said to him, how many times shall I adjure thee that thou say nothing but the truth to me in the name of the Lord? Then he said, this is the prophet speaking, I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return, therefore, every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would not prophesy good unto me but evil? Again he said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall entice, you know, trick, who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead, you know, fall, like fall down dead. And one spake, saying after this manner, and another saying after that manner. Then there came out a spirit, you know, an angel, and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit, and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Whoa. Now this is not, this is not one of the devil's angels. This is one of the Lord's angels. You think about it. I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets, Ahab's false prophets. And the Lord said, thou shalt entice him and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. You know what? This is, this is some heavy-duty stuff here, people. When's the last time you've ever heard this taught in church? This is not the devil doing a lying spirit. No, this is the Lord. The Lord put a lying spirit in the mouth of the false prophets against the wicked king. Think about that. I mean, woof, that's some heavy duty stuff. Then Zedekiah, the son of Shenanah, came near and smote Micaiah upon the cheek. You know, he slapped him in the face and said, which way went the spirit of the Lord for me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see on that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. Then the king of Israel said, Take ye Micaiah and carry him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison and feed him with bread of affliction and with water of affliction until I return in peace. And Micaiah said, If thou certainly return in peace, 
Then hath not the Lord spoken by me? And he said, Hearken, all ye people. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and will go to the battle, but put thou on thy robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went to the battle. Now, Bob's note here. Think about this. The king of Israel is going to disguise himself, and he's going to let everybody think that the king of Judah, the good king, is the king of Israel to the enemy army. So he's putting the king of Judah into harm's way. Think about it. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went to battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him saying, fight ye not with small or great, save only with the king of Israel. You know, don't fight, don't fight the, uh, the soldiers. Go after the king of Israel. Go after him. Cut off the head of the snake. Well, that's the Bob translation. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, It is the king of Israel. Therefore they compassed about him to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. For it came to pass that when the captains of the chariots perceived it was not the king of Israel, they turned back again from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow, you know, a bow of arrow, at a venture, and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Therefore he said to his chariot man, Turn thy hand, that thou mayest carry me out of the host, you know, the host, uh, the army, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, howbeit the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Syrians until the even, about the time of the sun going down, he died. You know, when the Lord, uh, when the Lord decides it's your time to go because of your wickedness, it don't matter if you have a disguise or not. And he got an, an arrow and probably in the back. I don't know. Harness. I don't know. Second Chronicles chapter 19. Now Jehoshaphat, you know, the good king, right? And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, uh, what's a seer? A seer is just an old, old name for a prophet because they could see the future or see the Lord's will. So they called him the seer. Um, so basically, this guy is uh, a seer is just before they called it a prophet. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him, went out to meet Jehoshaphat, the good king of Judah, and said to King Jehoshaphat, well, he's got a question for him. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Should we help those that are evil? Should we love those that hate the Lord Jesus Christ? Good question. Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Even though he was righteous and he loved the Lord, he was not in God's will. You want to help the ungodly? You want to help the wicked? You want to love those that hate Jesus Christ? Don't be surprised if God's wrath is upon you. Think about that when you bless those that hate Jesus. Verse 3. Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land. See, Jehoshaphat didn't play around. He got rid of the Satan worship in his land. He got rid of it. And guess what, people? Bob's note here. 
1966, the Church of Satan was created in the United States. And we tolerate this filth. Yeah. You think God's pleased? You know? And, and you wonder why people believe in the pre-trib rapture? God put a lying spirit in the mouth of all those false prophets. And if you want to see them, turn on your television, turn on TBN, turn on the 700 Prophets of Ball Club. If they're on TV and they're famous and popular, you know they're lying. Seriously. You know they're lying. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, and that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. And Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. See, Jehoshaphat did some good things for the Lord there. And he set judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Take heed what ye do, for ye judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you, Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. You know, gifts as in bribes, you know. Moreover in Jerusalem did Jehoshaphat set of the Levites and of the priests and of the chief of the fathers of Israel for the judgment of the Lord and for controversies when they returned to Jerusalem. And he charged them, saying, Thus shall ye do in the fear of the Lord faithfully and with a perfect heart. And what cause soever shall come to you of your brethren that dwelt in their cities between blood and blood, between law and commandments, statutes and judgments, ye shall even warn them that they trespass not against the Lord, and so wrath come not upon you and upon your brethren. This do, and ye shall not trespass. Yep, don't trespass against the Lord. Good, uh, good idea. And behold, Amariah, the chief priest, is over you in all matters of the Lord. And Zebediah, the son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah, for all the king's matters. Also the Levites shall be officers before you. Deal, deal courageously, and the Lord shall be with the good. And that people is the um the end of chapter what chapter six i think it's chapter six yeah chapter six that's the end you know uh god will put a lying spirit and deceive people i mean think about it You know, people, when I ask uh, regular demon nominational churchgoers, would God deceive people? Would he send a lying spirit to deceive people? Almost everybody answers, no, God would never do that. No, he would never do that. Well, guess what? Yes, he would. Didn't we just read that? Well, that's the Old Testament chaplain, Bob. That's That's not, you know... That's, that's the Old Testament. Like, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are two different gods. You know, that's that old, evil New Testament, or I mean, Old Testament God, they'll tell you. Yeah, I don't think so. All right, well, is there a New Testament witness that confirms what God did in the Old Testament? Uh, yeah. The Apostle Paul. You know, the guy they say is a false apostle. Paul's a false apostle, they'll tell you, because he exposes a lot of things, people. How about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1? Now, what is the subject of this chapter? The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Uh, preterists, people that say that everything happened in prophecy in 70 AD. Uh, were we gathered together unto, with Jesus in 70 AD? Uh, no, I, not me. I don't know about you, but, you know. By our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. So, Paul warns you, don't be deceived. For that day, what day? The second coming, the coming of Christ. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. What do you mean a falling away first? Are people going to fall off a log? Are they going to fall off a hill? No. A falling away of the faith. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, second coming, for that day, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Christ is not going to come until there's a falling away for the faith, and we're here, buddy boy, girly girl, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Perdition means to fall. There's only two times the son of perdition is mentioned in the Bible. The first time is Judas Iscariot is called son of perdition. Yeah, but there's going to be another one. The man of sin, the son of perdition. Verse four, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he is God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now, unless this happened in 70 AD, this is future. It's future, people. Don't listen to those preterists. They're idiots. They're pseudo, which means false or fake. They're pseudo-Bible scholars. They want to tell you that a Roman general in 70 AD went into the temple and proclaimed, I am God. Well, you know what? If a Roman general proclaimed that he was God, do you think the Roman emperor, the emperor of Rome would have had something to say about that? Hey, uh, Roman emperor, uh, I'm a general under your command, uh, you know, your army, but I'm God, so you're going to have to worship me. Uh, can you imagine that happening? Uh, I can't. I think the Roman emperor would have had the general's head on a platter. Oh, wait, that was his son. Yeah, did you know that uh, General Titus was uh, the son of the Roman emperor? I, I don't think the son could have told his father that I'm God and you're going to have to worship me. You know, this is the stupidity that these 70 AD preterists all prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD. This is their stupidity. Seriously. Uh, God puts a lying spirit in, in them. Really. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes, opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And the pre-trippers will tell you that's the Holy Spirit take, being taken out of the way. People, if the Holy Spirit was ever taken away from this earth, people would never be convicted of their sin 
and they would never come to faith in Jesus Christ. Personally, I think this is probably Michael the, uh, the angel, Michael the archangel. That would be my guess. Michael's probably going to stand aside by being told by the Lord, stand aside, let the devil have his due, and we'll see who's faithful and we'll see who will follow the devil. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Did this happen in 70 AD? Did the Lord consume the man of sin with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed with the brightness of his coming? Um, well, if he did, I missed it. What about you? And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. People, let me tell you something. The false prophet is going to be able to do miracles just like Elijah did. He'll, matter of fact, the false prophet will probably call himself Elijah. And he's going to have power and be able to do signs and lying wonders, uh, satanic miracles. And if you don't understand this, read the first chapter of Job. Satan was allowed to do all kinds of miracles to kill Job's children and be able to give Job uh, sicknesses and stuff. I mean, you know, Satan has power. Only, you know, he's on a leash and God only allows that leash to go out so far and he has to get permission from the Lord to do it. Really, read Job chapter one. Pause right now and read Job chapter one and then come back. So, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. You know, this is why these people say Paul is a false apostle. This is right here. This tells you what's going to happen in the last days. This is one of the big reasons why they tell you, Paul's a false apostle. Don't read Paul. Because Paul warned you of Satan's devices, his tricks and his little, yeah. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They don't get they don't want to get on their hands and knees and and repent and turn away from their wickedness and seek forgiveness and and praise the name of Jesus. No, 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 no. They want to live in their sin. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God not the devil. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. God sends them the delusion that they should believe a lie. Not the devil. God. Do you know what a delusion means? It means to believe something that's not true. That's what a delusion is. You know, you ever heard the expression, ah, he's delusional. He thinks he's the president of the United States. Well, sort of kind of the current occupant of the White House, I guess. But, uh, you know. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned. Damned. Talk about some harsh language. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in of unrighteousness. 
You want to have pleasure in unrighteousness? God will let you do it. Oh, absolutely. That's your idol. Some people's idols is sex, other people's money, others like power. God will send them strong delusion that they would believe a lie. Verse 13, but we are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, beloved brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you. Oh boy, that sounds like election. That sounds like Calvinism. We can't have that. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. God will send them strong delusion that they will believe a lie. Wow. That's some pretty harsh stuff. I ask people, would God lie to people? And they say, oh no, God would never do that. Uh, maybe you got a different God than I do. But if you live in unrighteousness, like Ahab, absolutely. Another thing they get all messed up is, does God love everybody? Uh, well, <laughs> does God love everybody? Uh, no. No, he certainly does not. Nope. God hated Esau. Of course, Esau hated God. You know, Malachi 1 and chapter 1 and verse 3, the prophet writes, And I hated Esau, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountain and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Malachi. Paul writes in Romans 9.13, as it is written, Paul is confirming what Malachi says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. You know, you could ask those two questions, people. Does God love everybody? And would the Lord deceive people? And ask a hundred churchgoers, and you might get two or three people out of a hundred, maybe a thousand, I don't know, that would actually get those two questions right. Such is the ignorance, lack of knowledge and understanding of, of the Bible today. I, people, I, I don't claim to be any kind of scholar. You know, I'm just some guy that's read the Bible a couple times. That's all. And I've had some good teachers, some really good teachers. You know, and did I ever want this job to teach the Bible? No, I didn't ask for this job. The Lord kind of put it upon me. And I hope the Lord considers me faithful. You know, people, I, Bible teachers are held to a higher standard. It's scary, people. It's scary to think that every word that I've taught, I'm going to be responsible for. One day, I'm going to have to give an account for everything I've taught. And I've been wrong. Yeah. But the difference between me and those on TV is I don't try to deceive people for, for, for mammon, for riches. That's the only difference between me and them. So pray for me, people. Pray for me, really, please, I need it. I mean, I've got, I got the enemy working, you know, against me, always. And I've been, I've fallen a few, many, well, a number of times. I don't know about many, but I, I, more than a few, a number of times. So, 
And I, I want to thank all of you that have uh, kept me in your prayers and um, helped me out. I really do appreciate it. Really, I do. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.